methods have been developed. Some are qualitative, some are terribly simple, and that's good because we need these methods and some are very more complicated in combinations of uh, quantitative methods and uh, protection layers and the idea is model the system in a realistic way and assign probabilities. And use the rules of probability to solve the problem. This is a, a picture from a, a, a standard risk analysis, our risk analysis standard. And, and many of the simple qualitative methods are given in these standards. Some of them are given in 61508 out in the informative sections. They're given in other standards out in their informative sections. Our purpose is simple. Evaluate risks versus tolerance. Simple methods are often and commonly used first. We sit down and evaluate all the potential risks, compare them to the tolerances. There's three fundamental methods, which are almost the same thing in my view. Risk graphs, risk matrix, and calibrated risk matrix. For example, in a risk graph, you might estimate the likelihood as a category. You might estimate the consequence as a category for injury, fatalities, economics, or environmental. And then you can consider occupancy or probability of avoidance. It's very simple. There's only two, quote, layers of protection included in the method. This was originally developed for machine safety applications, and it kind of makes a lot of sense. I mean, if the machine's coming after you and you can run, run away, fine. You've got a high probability of avoiding the hazard. Uh, if that robot's coming in and you see it and you can jump out of the way, good. Do so, please. And if nobody's there when that machine comes in, or when that robot arm swings around, nobody's going to be hurt or killed. This is what a risk graph looks like. You select your parameters, your avoidance parameters, and you get a sill level. It's really simple. I just want to show you that there are simple methods available where you categorize this metric or parameter, you categorize this parameter, you categorize this parameter and this parameter in groups. And there's a lot of judgment involved in that characterization, correct? Oh yeah, and that's Very the problem. Subjective. It is subjective, somewhat. Yet, if you get a group, I'll call it calibrated, then they can really move through stuff pretty quickly. Because often you find yourself down in here. Well, that's really just not a problem at all. There is a tolerable risk criteria embedded in this method. You don't get to see it. You don't really know what it is. If it's calibrated with any numbers at all, I can reverse engineer it, and so can you. But it's, it's in there already. For example, in the machine safety standard 62061, there's a simple qualitative method where you estimate the severity, first parameter. Then the frequency, then the probability of occurrence of the hazardous event, and the probability of avoiding the harm. So this is basically uh, occupancy, this is likelihood, and this is probability of avoidance. This is the same method as the other one when you really get down to swapping the words around. And they have a scoring system. I'll go ahead and show you some of these slides. For example, severity. There's <coughs> four levels. So I'm just showing you one example of a simple method with one level down. And they have examples. If it requires first aid, okay, that's a one. If it's attention from a medical practitioner, that's a two. If it's irreversible, like broken limbs, losing a finger, it's a three. Or irreversible, like death, or losing an eye or an arm, and I don't know who wrote it or why, but that's what they've got, and that's a four. So you look at these things and you make a judgment, subjective, 
What category is it in? Okay, it's a three. Next. How often is a worker exposed? Well, less than one times per year, you get two points. And it goes up and up to five points. Okay, that's occupancy in effect. That's just their method. Now, probability of occurrence. This is, this is kind of negligible, rarely. All you have are these words. And whatever the words mean to individual people, you got to pick a number and you get some points. The problem is there's no calibration. And what does rarely mean? Once every 10 years or once every 100 years? Your group must kind of decide that up front, typically in a corporate procedure, and then use the method. I've seen that I have seen different companies interpret this differently and use it differently. Now there is some description of, of, of what this should be in the standard, but again, there's no numbers. The whole thing, there's a, there's a lot of words here, and in my view, they should have let the numbers answer the question, or at least given it that way. And we go on to the probability of avoiding the harm, probable, rarely, impossible. Same thing again, no numbers, no calibration. So it could be gamed, but usually you have a group of people involved who work very hard not to. And then it's just a matter of, well, if you happen to get a group that doesn't really understand the situation, you could get bogus results. That is the way risk analysis has been for the last, uh, many, for many decades. There's nothing new about this. These are old methods that have been around for many decades. When you get into quantitative methods, we use this fundamental concept of an accident sequence. There's always a bunch of things that go wrong. Frequently, there's more than one thing that goes wrong. There might be some initiating event, and there was no avoidance, and there might have been something else that went wrong. And the people might have been present, and then there was an accident. Now, some of these sequences can get long and complicated, but you define the sequence, estimate the probability of each event in the sequence, calculate the resulting frequency of the accident, and compare it to tolerable risk. If that frequency, that inherent risk with this set of conditional modifiers is higher than tolerable, then you must specify an additional safety function. Metrics used are probable loss of life, probable injury, probable economic loss greater than a million, or whatever the th tolerable risk criteria is. For each category, you establish a maximum frequency, a common method. Sometimes if multiple fatalities are invent, sometimes if multiple fatalities can occur, the frequency is lowered. And that makes sense too. You get the frequency of the initiating event. Whatever it is, we estimate the how often it will happen. And for each protection layer, will it work or will it fail? The next protection layer, will it work? or will it fail? And if they all fail, we will get consequences exceeding the criteria. We may get some other undesirable outcomes, but they won't be above uh, criteria. And finally, the safe outcome is when one of the layers works. Sometimes these go all the way up. You draw an event tree to match reality of what's for this particular situation. Um, I, I, I chose one outside the process industries. This was a machine example. There was a tolerable risk criteria of 1 times 10 to the minus 6 established for probable loss of life. And they started with the machine drives into an unintended area. And the primary initiating event was the controller failed in mode number 3. And 
a detailed analysis of the controller gave us 5.63 e to the minus 6 failures per hour or 0.047 events per year. In this particular analysis, this was sanitized but it was real, the machine will not be driving by an unintended area more than 10 minutes a day. Most of the time it's working in an area where there's nobody <laughs> and it has to drive through the area. So. 10 over 1440, 1440 minutes per day, probability of <clears throat> going through the intended area is 007. Well, even if it goes into an unintended area, it may or may not be occupied, but 80% of the time it is. But we take credit for that. And then there's a question of how many people are in there, by the way, and how many people might get hurt, and this was challenged. And uh, <clears throat> in this particular analysis, I concluded no more than four people. Um, so we multiplied by four to, 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 to give you a valid individual risk criteria because it could be four fatalities. Then we were worried about, they were worried about something else and finally they were arguing, said, forget it, worst case, N this doesn't work. Next, okay. Machine crashes into people causing a fatality. That frequency is 0.047, the initiating event, times probability that they will be driving in an unintended area and probability that it's occupied. That gives me a 0026 per year. Okay, what's the tolerable risk? Ah. Uh, we need a risk reduction factor of 260. Now, you can, once you do this, you can say, now hold it. We really need at least twice that. Fine. Take it up. Don't take it down. Take it up. Being sensitive to the cost of the, the impact of that statement. It might be more like 20 minutes a day. Okay. Once you see it, it's easier to, to gain perspective about what's sensitive and what's the sensitive factors and what aren't. I was in this group, this was about a year ago, and one guy really felt they should raise it to a thousand. And uh, we, that was a debate for a few hours, and it's okay. If there's a good reason, you should. And besides, at the end of the day, the people taking the risk need to make that decision. The people who work there people whose families work there. Now there are combination methods frequently used. I've seen many, many jobs in machine safety, in robotics, in automotive, and in process where a simple qualitative method is used first and then the ones that look like they are the highest risk, they are analyzed in more detail because that detail analysis takes a lot of time. And if you were doing that on every one, it would be uh, very expensive. Besides what happened, I'm sure I, I, sorry I can't really show you some real ones, but uh, what happens is there might be two or 3,000 uh, risk lines in an analysis. And when you get all done, in fact this particular one, there was probably 2,000, when we got all done, there was 12 that looked like they might be a big deal. And of those, three of them were a really big deal. And so those were, for three of them, a full-blown quantitative analysis was done. Standards change. And they're changing even faster now than they ever did before.